Hey everybody, today we're going to do the second tutorial in the environment series, where we are going to discuss how to approach your 3D projects like a storyteller to achieve your desired results. Ty here again from Daz3D. Now before we get started, please make sure you have downloaded and installed the Stonemason Sci-Fi Kit 2016, as that is what we'll be using for this tutorial. Now before I get started on any of my projects, there's a few things I always try to remember. Number one, I want to be deliberate about the choices I make. A change in a texture, object placement, color can have a big impact on overall tone. Number two, I like to think of a backstory, the who, what, where, to guide my project and allow me to make deliberate and consistent decisions. And number three, I try to think about unique ways to leverage the content that's in front of me and not always follow exactly what was provided or how it was designed. Okay, let's get started. So first thing we need to do is go to my Daz 3D library, go to props, stonemason, sci-fi kit. And if you don't have that installed, install that. But it's this really cool set from stonemason. Um, and once you've installed that, we can get started because that's gonna be the uh, main focus of this tutorial so we can have some fun. So back to content library. So 3 to light is not what we're gonna be rendering in. We're gonna be rendering an iRay. So we can just focus on this iRay folder here. Now, if we look at environments, most products and most people, how they use the products, will just double click and load the uh, provided scene. So this is the preset that Stonemason has made to show off this environment set he's made. And a lot of people, and perfectly reasonable, would come into this and they would just come into this world. Now, if you remember, we navigate our camera with middle mouse wheel to zoom in, control and alt, to left click look around and right click to pan and dolly. Now we're currently inside this set. So we're, we're in texture shaded. We're just gonna switch this to texture shaded. Sorry, we're in smooth shaded. And so that's pretty cool. So before we do a test render, before we see what it actually looks like, we're gonna go control R to bring up our render settings. Remember we changed this hotkey. And then we're going to turn a couple things off because as we get further into this, we want to be in full control of our light choices, our render settings and how it renders. And we don't want anything to render uh, when we're doing test renders that we don't actually need because it'll slow us down. So go to the editor, go to general, and we're going to change this to uh, act, leave it at active viewport. We don't want to have the uh, constraint lines yet, but like the TV safe, but we're gonna go into environment and we're actually gonna turn off draw ground. What draw ground does just for reference, if I'm looking below the grid and I try and render, and I'll just show you control shift R to do a quick render, you're gonna see that it actually puts me under the ground. I can't actually see anything. It's gonna put me below the floor. So we don't want that because that's actually going to get in our way. So, so by default, if you had a, a proper character, you would have a ground plane. But you see, we have ground plane off, so it's not a, in obstructing our view. So that's good. That's what we want. So most people have it when no when no scene lights, it's on. We want to change auto headlamp to never, and that means that if there's no lights in the scene, it'll render black. We want to render what's in the scene. We don't want it to interpret or add anything. So then in environment mode, back in environment, we want to change that from dome and scene to just scene only. What dome and scene does is it uses an HDR map and uses a big dome and lightens your scene. But we want to remove that because it's going to change the lighting in our scene. So now in render settings, in progressive render, we're going to cut max samples in half. We're going to cut max time in half to 3600. And we're going to change render quality to zero. Now you can even go lower than this, but this is just means when we click render to do a quick test render, it'll just be a lot faster, a lot lighter weight. It won't take as long because we're less concerned over the overall render output and quality. We just want to see what it looks like. This helps us see our current lighting setup, our current colors, our current layout comp composition. That's just far more important to see quickly that we're going the right direction with colors, composition, stuff like that. So we get a pretty good idea just from this. And you can see that there's a lot of dots and it's not, it's not perfect, but it gives you a really good sense of the direction we're going. Perfectly cool and understandable to take this scene as is, 
drop a character in and have fun with this and really focus on that character. I mean, some people use heavy depth of field. So it's really just tone. But if I move my mouse around, you'll see the different things that light up. And those are all modular things that have been provided in this kit. So like all of a sudden what that means, I mean, you think of that, you see that, you let your imagination run wild and you're like, wait, what else can I do? And I mean, he's done a really nice job of hierarchy here. So there's a major null running this whole environment. And then he has another null that's running this N chunk instance here. So that's actually really, really nice. And those are habits we're gonna borrow and we're gonna use along the way. So I think of this as being, okay, I got a Lego set. I got a box. I built what was on the box. I built what was in the instructions. I built what it told me to build. But what if we looked at this a little bit differently? What if we select this null and we select all of its children and we just blow it away? And we're just going to delete everything in our scene, clear our scene right out. Now we have nothing. We can now look at the kit itself. Think of it as like throwing the bricks, like the Lego bricks all over the floor. We have all these walls and columns. Look at all these options we have. We have like this panel here. And if we just double click, it'll go in our scene. Then we hit control F, frame it. We got this really cool corner panel. I really like this panel. We're going to definitely use this one. It wasn't in the thing we just looked at. But like here, we're looking at this backwards. So we'll rotate so we can see it. But like this is a beautiful piece. Look how cool that is, right? But here's the other kicker. So all of these elements, these trim elements with the little computer deck on it. And then we have lights. We have floors. We have war walls. But all of these elements. And, and like real quick. Remember our joint trick, right? And if you imagine we had two of these, if we know the distance they need to go, so let's say that's 56 centimeters, right? Well, we can change this X translate nudge, remember, back at the cog, go to parameter settings, and we change that nudge to be 56 and accept. Now, if we nudge that and we duplicate, Look how easy it is going to be to build a wall, a world, whatever. That's super powerful. And so that's going to be a lot of fun for us in a minute here. But we also have what Stonemason's included in this set, which has made this so powerful. And why I like this set so much is this materials folder. Look at all these material options. That's where it really, you know, becomes just throw the bricks on the floor and see what you can play with. I mean, look at the tonal difference between the these two, right? Like we're going to kill what's in the scene real quick. But look at the name of the panel, panel 13. So we go back to walls and trims and we grab panel 13. There it is. Load that into our scene. Now we click panel 13, select it. And now we go back to materials and we apply one of these alternate materials. Now we have to select the object. So if we have nothing selected and I double click on this material to apply the material to panel 13, we get an error. So it'll toss us an error, nothing happens. But if we select the panel and then now double click color three, Boom, now it's changing, right? Another way we can select it, remember, is in the scene folder, and then we can grab panel 13 dark. But what I wanna highlight is look how aesthetically different these are. Look at the tone you're getting. Like, it just, so different, completely different feel. You got like the Mass Effect vibe, and then you got a little bit more of a cleaner vibe. And then we got, look, so now let's look at panel five, back in our walls, load, load panel five, and then go into materials and now look at these guys. I'm gonna grab this guy, color three. And it has this really cool deck, decal, or we can load this one, which is a little more plain, but we have the clean versions, we have the dirty versions. Look at this one, it's all like mostly white, but it's chewed up a bit, completely different aesthetic. Each compartment has a label, so it feels like like compartments, not a wall. So it just means we have so much flexibility with this kit. And what we gotta do, and when you, when you just look at these things and plan out your set, you wanna be deliberate. You wanna think like you're the director, the cinematographer, the set deck, all rolled into one. And so you wanna think like the purpose, like w w the purpose of these things. Like, like if I, I'm gonna load a couple different panels to give you examples. So like if I load in panel three, and panel four. I'm gonna show you how these objects can give you a completely different feeling. So 
So if we look at these guys in isolation, they look like they're from two very different movies, right? Like two very different sci-fi. Now, if we grab this guy and apply this decal, all of a sudden it has a completely different vibe. Like this heavy industrial, like military installation look. Like it's just been old, it's been beat up. It's whereas like this has this clean and like starship, like almost like international space station look. It's almost like Star Trek versus Star Wars, right? And so these are the choices you get to make. And then with this guy over here, same idea, right? This looks like a couple panels, but if you change it to this one, now all of a sudden it's a little bit dirtier and like it's almost half-life looking. And then this one, well, now it's completely inverted, dark, like looks almost like an engineering deck setting the mood, right? So one of the things important that I really find helpful when you're designing anything and in particularly when you're dealing with 3D and assets and environments and trying to come up with a plan on how to build out a set is to come up with a backstory, right? Like really decide what it is. Where is this place? What is its use? Is it a starship? Is And if it's a starship, is it a research facility? Is it a military ship? Is it a medical ship? If it's a station, what's the station's purpose? Um, if it's an installation on a planet, like how long has it been there? Is it new? What is it? Who lives there? And what do they do? Because if you have that in mind, you can start thinking a little more broadly, right? Like if this here is a door or just a hallway, maybe this line is like a safety hatch and it's always open and only closed when it's important. But maybe if this is a door on a ship or into a cargo bay, then maybe we want to grab one of the other walls, like panel 13, for example, and we want to put it right inside Forgot to mention in the parameters, this gray one is uniform scale. So now we go to auxiliary viewport and we hit control, click and then hit control F. And we can actually see how this lines out. We're gonna go to hidden line removal so we can see the depth. And then we're gonna just pull it up because we have a gap at the top and we lift it up to close that gap. So now the door fills in, fits inside our new door frame. Switch it to wireframe. I really like this auxiliary viewport in wireframe personally, because I can look through walls and stuff. It's really handy. So now we have this really cool looking like hatch door. And if we go to materials and go to paint panel 13, we'll see what we can do with it. Well, now look at that. Like we can even set it so it's slightly open. So now what I'm imagining is that's a half open door to the crew quarters section C. And for some reason, you know, that was blocked off. It can't open all the way. Like then we can grab a trim and this guy here, the trims are nice because it gives you a little break in the repetitive aesthetic and like creates interaction and gives you a sense of what's there. Like this trim's awesome because it, it's one of my favorites. Cause in this scenario, this trim looks like it's the controls for that crew door. Right. So, so we can reset our door and let's see what we have in the materials for this guy here. Let's go with black. Cause we're just going for that kind of darker aesthetic. See now like things aren't going well in this station. Like it feels old and run down wherever we join this story. Um, something went wrong. I would imagine that, uh, this is like a little derelict or, or everything's not quite going well or what it seems in this station. Maybe we change this to the black. And now it looks more like a cargo bay hatch, but, and you got the big handle there, which kind of works. Yeah, so you kind of get what I'm getting at here, right? Like this wasn't necessarily what this was designed to be. It was designed, like this here was designed to be a wall, not a door. But if we think beyond how things are just presented and if we look in the trims, and we look at the floor and the ceilings, there's these trim panels here. Well, we can use this same thing. We can rotate it. And then we're gonna use S, right? For that, that script we installed that gives us the incremental rotation, super powerful. Um, so we know we're exactly at 90 and we don't have to eyeball or type anything in, just a little bit faster. Move this forward. Remember to line it up with that line again. Now we can set this panel up like a couple Star Trek doors. 
and right and so now maybe it wasn't designed to be a door but because it's just a trim but it works perfectly fine as a drawer and so these are the things that you can do when you know like i said throw the lego pieces on the floor and look at everything and go what am i looking at here what what can i play with what can i really do that drives my story forward and tells you know um reinforces the story I want to tell, not necessarily what I've been provided. And that's what I really wanted to show you is how to load up materials, use some of these controls to move things around. And one thing you're going to want to do when you're making scenes is you'll probably want to make sure your uh, naming convention is clean. So you know what I'm duplicating to make the floor? I would actually rename that so it's clear what it is. And I'd actually take the prefix off, SMF3. But now if you do that, you gotta do it on all of them because when it duplicates, you want it to show how many you have because later it's super helpful. So the reason we get rid of SMF3 is so later I can just type panel 01 in the search up here and I can see it. Although, cause right now I don't. So if I get rid of the SMF3, like I said, on all of these, I can just show you how that works. Now, if I search floor one, I can go all the floor one I want and I can select them all at once. And then I can go, imagine if I go floor through ceilings and materials, I can select them all and quickly apply a new material to all of them. So if I had like 30 in my scene and I wanted to change them all, I could do that very easily through that method. So scene cleanliness is really important. It's often overlooked, but it makes a huge difference, especially for efficiency. And it's just very important for two reasons. One, that search function is super handy. And two, when you reopen this, you're not always gonna remember all the choices you made or if you handed it off to someone, it's always nice to have a clean scene just so you can figure out where you are and what you're trying to do. So even you think about this, right? If we look at panel one as our door, we wanna probably take floor one trim and floor one trim two and put it under panel one as the children because we want it to be that parent. Cause we only really wanna think of this as one solid object. You don't want to grab the pieces all the time. You just want to grab the door as a unit and move it around. And if you control shift D to duplicate nodes, you can make it for another deck up. So these kind of mini little prefabs are super helpful for us. So we're going to make those constantly. So we can go ahead and delete that. So just to recap, we went through. Okay, so one more cool little trick I want to show everybody is uh, for this, for this before we move on is the align tool. Now, the align tool can be super handy for doing some of this stuff. Um, so we're gonna go back into our prop and we're gonna go sci-fi kit and we're gonna go walls. This is the best indication of what we're gonna show you. So we're gonna grab pan panel two, grab panel 11, panel six. And pa panel three and panel four. Okay. so. Now, if we frame that, you can see that we just have a stack of stuff and it's all on top of each other. But depending on how we select it here in the scene, like the selection order, we'll go two, six, 11, three. Now, if we come up here to panes, a line, and we get this little pop-up, so now this is neat. What the line tool will do is we can line on on lefts, centers, origins, or rights. So what we'll do is we'll start with the line centers. And, and Z will align the backs so that they stay in a row and we'll hit apply. So see how it lined up in the middle? Now we do a line origin, sorry, line left, apply. So now I'll line on my left. So you can muck around. So you can see how it moves it around, right? But if we go stack to left, stack to right, now you can see what it's doing. Now you can see that it automatically lines up your elements perfectly from bounding box to bounding box. It's not flawless because like, obviously you would want to move this 
to the center, to the front, depending on the aesthetic you want. But you can also do that with the tool. But now if I change the selection order and go 6, 3, 2, 11, and I say align front and go apply. And now it's remix the order to the new selection order based on how we selected it. And you can see that these are different sizes. So it's just another way uh, to move things and snap things together to quickly remix and align to create this wall. So and if you make sure secondary nodes on, you can move that into place for your scene. So that's just a quick rundown of the align tool, which can be handy. And so it's something, if you think you'll lose use a lot, you can move that pane under tool settings. I won't use it that much. And in the next chunk of the tutorial, you'll see I don't really use it at all because I like the freedom of getting in there and moving around, seeing what's what and dropping the trims in and the different side objects. I wanna be able to line it up with the floor tiles. So I'm actually gonna use a different way of measuring and aligning things, but I just wanted to show you the align tool to just make sure you had one more thing to take advantage of in your tool bag. And the one thing I did forget is I didn't remember to save our scene. And remember that's like critical. And like one thing I talked in the last tutorial is make sure you save your scene. So come to your temp folder, hit plus, go scene, save the scene, tutorial two. But remember like hit just as valid as last time, save often, hit control S often. Every couple of minutes you're gonna do something, hit control S because you're never gonna be upset for having too much scenes. I didn't because we weren't creating something that was meant to last. I was just running through this, but I should have saved. And what made me remind that is right before I render, I always hit control S and that's what reminded me to do this. So, so control shift R, quick test render, just to see how things are doing. So we don't actually have any lights in the scene, so we won't really much see much. Um, but so yeah, you can see it's just black. So if we did wanna get a little sense, one last little thing I'm gonna do, probably don't need to, but why not? And that's part of the creative process, right? You change your mind as you go, and one thing leads to another and leads to another train of thought, and that's really the fun of it all. So I'm gonna put this light in the scene, duplicate, I'm gonna put two of them, just cause. So this is where my uh, my recommendation falls apart, right? Because nobody is gonna put a fluorescent light on the floor where people, right by a door where people need to have high traffic. That's a terrible design. That's That would never happen. So when you're actually doing your project, don't do this. But this is just to show uh, that with lights in the scene, our scene will actually render and the lights will create some light splash, but yeah. You can imagine if you had a bunch of people running through this installation back and forth through that door, anything you wouldn't want a floor light on the floor, but then maybe this was a zero G installation, then maybe the light would make sense. Uh, but you can see here, the lights, what is driving the scene because we've turned off dome and scene. So the only thing that's driving that is the light and the trim, but yeah, that lets us keep an eye on what we're doing. So, and in summary, we chatted through how to think like a storyteller. We looked at some tips and tricks and ways to approach and look at items a little bit differently than they maybe were presented to you or designed so that you could create something uniquely yours. In the next tutorial, we're actually going to go through and build a little set and we're gonna talk about lining up walls, uh, snapping things together, and then really remix and play with the elements here. So thanks for listening.